so we, we're going to, as I was saying, we're going to talk about the ambulatory cerebral palsy, the GMF cess ones, twos, and threes. And in these groups of, uh, of patients, the approach is uh, totally different than what uh, Dr. Uh, Hyman was talking about. So first of all, I have no uh, conflict uh, in regards to uh, this talk. And the first thing that I'd like to say is that I believe, and I've believed over the last 25 years, that uh, every patient who is going to be submitted or is considered uh, to have orthopedic interventions to improve gait should have three-dimensional gait analysis. Uh, in Australia, in Melbourne, we had the privilege and the possibility to do that in most patients. Uh, in Victoria and in, in uh, New South Wales. And I think the same applies to certain regions of the United States, but unfortunately not, not all the, the, the children um, have the availability of this technology to uh, help their surgeons to decide which, is, uh, which are the best treatments. So normally gait analysis should be done before uh, the interventions and after the intervention so that not only we can understand what we've done, how gait has been changed, and if there's anything else that could or should be done in the future. So gait analysis is not a new technology. You've, you've heard about it for the last uh, at least 20, 30, or 40 years. And I, I'm gonna tell you briefly what we've learned from this technology. And also, I, I'd like to tell you that most of the interventions that we use in this day and age to improve gait in patients with cerebral palsy, these interventions have been uh, 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 studied through th three-dimensional gait analysis. And this technology has brought us a lot of understanding and, and a lot of new knowledge as to what seems to work better and what doesn't seem to work at all. And it also helps us to, uh, come up with uh, the concept of surgical dosing, meaning not every patient benefits or needs or requires the, the same amount of surgery and the same types of surgery. And this is a very important concept, in my opinion. So what has it taught us over the last 40 years or so? In my case, only 25 years. Uh, <clears throat> well, the first important thing is that when we lengthen muscles and tendons. What we may, up be doing, we, we may be doing at the end of the day is to basically increase the muscle weakness that these patients have. And sometimes these muscle weakness produced through um, aggressive muscle lengthenings or premature muscle lengthenings, it doesn't show immediately, it shows later, like is the case of this uh, patient. And uh, this patient I've just met in New York a few weeks ago, and she had the, what people think uh, nowadays is the most wonderful surgeries, which is percutaneous hamstring surgeries. You know, nowadays we hear about percutaneous as the miracle surgery with no incisions. But this uh, uh, patient had percutaneous hamstring lengthenings 18 years ago. And you can see what's happening 18 year, years later. She has gross hyperextension of her knees. And because her hamstrings have disappeared from the back of her legs, she cannot control her pelvis anymore. So a patient that could have been a GMF cess 2 for the rest of her life now requires wheelchair for long distances and requires crutches for most distances not to mention that she has significant back pain because she walks in a, in a lot of lower doses. So this is the first principle that we've learned, that we, shouldn't, we should not be doing these this kinds of surgeries anymore. People have tried that 40, 30, 50, 60 years ago, and they abandoned these, these operations. And uh, when we do get analysis and we follow these patients long term, we continue to realize and verify and document that these are not good interventions. The, others, the second principle that I'd like to, to talk about is the principle that involves lever arms. 
So to make it simple, in simple terms, what we could say is that muscles that try to push a skeleton full of liver deformities or full of liver disease or dysfunctions, they're gonna fail. So if you consider that the, the muscles are already weak by definition because the patients have cerebral palsy and then the lower limbs are all twisted in opposite directions like it's this case, then the muscles will fail. And that's why patients with cerebral palsy very often have the gait patterns that they have. That's one of the main reasons. So <clears throat> what has gait analysis taught us then? Well, it taught us to be very conservative in terms of muscle and tendon lengthenings. And we use techniques nowadays that, that, that produce very little lengthening of the muscle fibers. But in, in turn, it preserves the muscle power, uh, which is crucial for these patients. We uh, prefer to do very often muscle or tendon transfers rather than, than lengthens. And at times we try to even shorten certain, certain muscles and I'll tell you about it in a couple of minutes. So to extend knees in, in, in cerebral palsy in GMFSS twos and threes primarily, we very rarely lengthen the hamstrings these days. Uh, my favorite surgery in, in cerebral palsy is the semitendinosus transfer. Uh, and this is when we take the semi-T from below the knee and reattach it above the knee. In doing so, we decrease what we call the knee flexion moment or the knee flexion forces. But because we attach semi-T so firmly to the bone or to the tendon above the knee, this muscle continues to extend the hip and the pelvis. So the pelvis tends not to fall forwards like in that uh, patient that I just showed. And when that's not enough, then we can manipulate the way the, 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 the distal femora grow through uh, what we call guided growth. And we can, we can correct a few more degrees of fixed knee flexion deformity. So basically nowadays, we try our best to spare the hamstrings uh, when we're treating people to walk better. The other thing that we do at times when, when this, the, the, these patients don't have uh, the ability to bend the knees very often in, in swing phase, uh, we can transfer rectus femoris, and we can transfer rectus femoris to gracilis, to semi T, or to fascia lata. And Dr. Gage and Jacqueline Perry were the first ones to propose these surgeries uh, more than 20 years ago or so. And they are fabulous surgeries to unlock the knee. The only problem is that very often these surgeries are done at the same time as Crouch is present. And that's not a good uh, combination. If the knees are already bending, and if you take rectus away, that might contribute to further uh, knee flexion stance. And um, lastly, when, we, uh, when, we, when we've had uh, someone in crouch for uh, many years, we have what we call patella alta, a stretched quadriceps, and uh, nowadays what we do for those patients is to shorten the patellar tendon and sometimes we extend the distal femur through osteotomies. There are two, uh, the, the, these are the two more common techniques. The one we proposed a, lot of, uh, a long time ago and the one from Minnesota. One shortens the tendon and the other one advances the insertion of the tendon. So we, uh, we correct the levers, we untwist the levers whenever possible and safe. So this is courtesy of Professor Kerr Graham uh, from Melbourne. You saw this kid very twisted and we did a few osteotomies and much further down the track, this, this person continues to be straight and well aligned. These are the osteotomies we normally do. We derotate the proximal femur, we derotate or extend the distal femur, and we derotate the tibias. And very often we do osteotomies to the feet as well. And these are the extension osteotomies. If the deformity in the distal, the, the knee deformity is too severe, in order to spare the hamstrings, instead of lengthening hamstrings, we extend the femur to correct the, the, the deformity. Thank you very much.